You can hear me? It's working? Make sure your sound is on. Perfect. Now it's on. Okay. Uh, the men of the Great Assembly having some prophets among them at the beginning, but towards the end, already what's known as the end of prophecy and um, beginning of the rabbinic era with the pairs ending up with Hillel and Shammai heading towards the period of the sages. Hopefully soon we're going to see a little bit of the movie that uh, we mentioned about the destruction of the second temple. Why? Lagbomer, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Obviously, this is the last day of the week, but I'll see you at Thanks, Help yourself, yeah. This is regular water, actually, because it was not here. So I, I put it in regular water. Sorry. But, uh, uh, everybody meet Moshe and Moshe, meet everybody. Uh, there's another Moshe. There's two Moshe's here. Moshe? Uh, Moshe's Moshe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll all meet each other on, th- on Wednesday. At 11 o'clock, we're having a, a gathering. Oh, Hashem. Erev Yeah. Um, in any case, we're uh, learning one of the most classic passages in the entire Talmud. It's known as the Oven of Achnai. Tanuroj al Achnai where Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua are arguing about whether this type of oven is pure or impure. And Rabbi Eliezer tries to prove his point by, pull, by pulling miracles out of the hat. Right, who remembers what the miracles were? Um, that was the last one. What's the first one is a tree, uproot the tree. And the river stream, the heavenly voice, and then the, and then the, the walls, the walls the tilt, uh, and then the heavenly voice. What's a heavenly voice in Hebrew? It's called batko, batko, bat. kol, kol, batkol, batkol, kol. exactly, batkol. Yes, ah. sort of the, the echo of a voice, uh, the daughter of a voice, right? So some kind of a um, resounding cry from the heavens that was heard by the wall, which seemed to indicate that Rabbi Yehuda is correct. We always have to follow Rabbi Dezer. Along came the rabbis and said, sorry, who's in charge here? Who's in charge? In the radical formulation, is God in charge or are we in charge? And essentially they say, we aren't in charge. How could that be? Well, the proof text is... Why are we, how could we have the gall to override the voice from heaven? The answer is we don't have that right unless it was given to us by God. And where did we get this right to follow the majority? From the Torah. From the Torah, that's right. The original revelation at Sinai gave that power to the rabbis. Maybe has never been exercised as strongly as it is being exercised now, 1,500 years later, or 1,000-something years later. The rabbis are coming into their own, and they're saying, we are deciding the laws of the Torah. And the, based on the sanction given to us by the Torah, the, the law follows the majority of the rabbis. If we're the majority, you can pull out miracles, and divine assistance, it won't help you in this court. It won't help you in this world. And they wanted to make their point so strongly that they decided, believe it or not, because Rabbi Yezer was having trouble with this. Rabbi Yezer was not accepting that. He was saying, I know I'm right. I even have divine proof. They decided to excommunicate Rabbi Eliezer. And this is where we left off yesterday. This is just a a review. We saw that to make this point, the rabbi said, uh, you know, we're going to excommunicate Rabbi Yezer. By the way, I'll just finish off again the review. The the Talmud records a, strangely enough, 
the proof of the correctness of this decision, of this, where does it come from? Eliyahu Hanavi. Some kind of a mystical revelation comes along and says, what was God doing at the time? And this is his smile. Eliyahu records that God was smiling and said, my children have triumphed over me. So it's a little bit ironic that the... Same kind of miracle. No, not the same kind of miracle. It's also like very... It's like a divine, it's divine voice. It's like a heavenly voice, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. not. Like the, the, the dream or what the, yeah, the vision... From the vision of Eliyahu, yes. Kind of, um, not really proof, um, exactly, exactly. It's very strange. It's not really brought as a proof. But it is, of course, in the context, it shows you that this tension, it's not that we totally disregard and say, we are now disconnected from the heavens. We don't, have, we don't give any credence to, to uh, divine assistance. There's a certain uh, dialectic here. Obviously, uh, the Talmud wouldn't record it if it was of no value. Oh, you had some dream of Eliyahu. That's meaningless. No, Rabbi Natan says, I met Eliyahu, and it's brought here, and... Uh, this is part of the conclusion of the Gemara that uh, Hashem gave his divine sanction to this approach and he said, my children have triumphed over me. And obviously, if your children triumph, it's your triumph. So God smiled. The assumption, the usual interpretation is that God agreed, God was happy that this, with this development, that the power is being, uh, the authority is in the hands of the sages and the sages are using it. And now let's see what they do with it. But the problem is, you know, when we have people in charge, we have politics. We have people, then uh, it gets complicated. So let's pick up in the middle of the page. If you still have your pages from yesterday, does everybody have the text I gave you? Yeah, Baba Metzia, 59b. So right in the middle, it says, on that day, um, they brought all the, uh, um, everything that was deemed uh, ritually pure by Rabbi Yezer, they, they burnt it, and the sages reached a consensus in his regard and ostracized him. Now, what do we do? Who will go, the sages said, who will go and inform him? Uh-oh, the sages, they were colleagues of Rabbi Eliezer. All of a sudden now, they're, they're pushing him out. So they were afraid. Rabbi Eliezer was a very powerful uh, individual, <laughs> especially if he just made the walls of the Beit Midrash almost collapse on top of them. Can you imagine that? That was also a little bit element of a threat. Rabbi Shur has sort of had to hold them up and keep them from destruction. But wow, Rabbi Eliezer was a threatening guy. He was not backing down. So who's going to go tell him that uh, you know, the, the sages have turned? The, the tables have turned. The sages have turned against you. So they decided to go to Rabbi Akiva. Akiva, please, you go. Because he was uh, a student of Rabbi Yezir. He was in good, on good terms. And hopefully he'll be the bearer of... of uh, he'll take the news better if it comes from his student... Rabbi Akiva. Okay, so who's going to read for us? Uh, David, you'll read for us? Yes. So, Rabbi Akiva is the love the disciple said to them, I will go, let an unseemly person go and inform him in a callous and offensive manner, and he would thereby destroy the entire world. Who would destroy the entire world? Uh, Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer is a powerful man. Okay, we're about uh, middle of the page. What did Rabbi Akiva do? It's, uh, I guess, the first words on the line are he wore black. Everybody see the first word of the line is he wore black? Mm -hmm. Okay, Rabbi Akiva wore black. What's black? It's, um, um, morning. Expression of mourning. Good. Of morning, yeah. yeah, yeah. He wore black and wrapped himself in black. That's an expression of mourning and pain. And said before Rabbi Akiva, at a distance of four cubits, four, uh, it's four miles. That's correct. Uh, which is the distance that one must maintain from an ostracized individual. Rabbi Eliezer said to him, Akiva, what is different about today from other days that you comport yourself in this manner? Rabbi Akiva said to him, My teacher, it appears to me that your colleagues are distancing themselves from you. So stop there. Stop there. Um, um, 
So Rabbi Kiva, what is he, uh, what methods is he using to break the news? I mean, he has to tell it straight, but uh, he wears black, he wears black he keeps which shows, what does that show? That he's sad. That he's sad. He That's sad. right. And how does he address him? My teacher. He still addresses him as a teacher. He says, it's true, I have to keep the laws for this, for Amot, I have to keep my distance, but I'm sad about it. This is a very a horrible thing. It's sort of, it, it's sort of like when someone introduces, before you just tell them, oh, you know, uh, you know your, your house is on fire. You, you say to them, I have some bad news to tell you. Right? It sounds like Rabbi Kiva sort of prefacing, saying, Something is going on here before he actually tells him. And then Rabbi Lezer asks what's going on. It's not just like he's coming and hitting him over the head with the hammer. Rabbi Lezer is asking for the news. He says, okay, I can see something's going on. You're, dis- you're sitting this and this. And he says, um, it appears to me, it appears to me, not like it's 100%, but Rabbi Kiva says it sort of uh, a little bit softer. Uh, that your colleagues are distancing themselves from you. They're not saying they're distancing you. They're distancing themselves from you. Also sort of softening it and saying, so we're pushing you out. We're, we have to keep, I have to keep separate. Not because you've been pushed out. But to <coughs> Okay, so go ahead. He, um, he, said he employed uh, euphemism. Said he employed euphemism and actually they distanced Rabbi Eleazar from them. Rabbi Eliezer too rent his garments and removed his shoes, as is the custom of an ostracized. Ostracized, yeah. Uh, ostracized, yes, ostracized. It's, a, it's a C that sounds like an S, yeah. Person. And he dropped from his seat and sat upon the ground. So it sounds like this went well. He accepted it. Yeah. He accepted it. He accepted it. He he. Uh, this was uh, the custom of somebody who was uh, excommunicated. So he tore his. His clothes, which is a symbol of tearing your clothes. When do you do that? When you're mourning and removing your shoes. Also, uh, a uh, custom of mourning. And he sat on the ground. Oh my gosh. He was, he took it, but he was upset. Go go ahead. The Gemara tells a story. His eyes shed tears, and as a result, the entire world was afflicted. One third of his fathers were afflicted, one third of his wheat, and one third of his barley. And some say that even though made it in a woman's hands, spoiled. Wow, wow. So this is uh, okay. right, yeah. amazing. What is it trying to tell us, this, this description? <coughs> Quick literary analysis. Dough, wheat, dough. barley, olives. It's the basic sustenance of the world. This is what people eat. And the, the raw materials even. The wheat, the barley, olives, of course, produce olive oil. This was the, the, the major uh, part of the economy of, of uh, livelihood. Yeah, the question is, yeah. why did they spoil? I mm. mean, uh, was it because the Rabbi Aleza somehow did something, or did something happen? Because, because of the distancing of, of Rabbi Aleza, that the world somehow... Um, overbrought the natural um, province. That's right. Somehow. That's right. It sounds like that. What, 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 what yeah. Was yeah. The, yeah. Well, it's a definitely. A, the, the, I think the Talmud is telling us that what this division, this uh, split within the rabbis was so significant and it was a yeah. very horrible thing in itself and that it affected uh, the world. Right, the world is affected by what people do. The, the physical world is affected by what people do. Our livelihood, entire economy, the entire, you know, all of, uh, all of the, the, the physical produce was ruined, spoiled, because of this horrible division. And it says, from the tears of Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer was, was made to cry by the other rabbis. A very negative result of this division. Up till now, we've been saying... How great it is. Look, power of the rabbis and, you know, the, the authority. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's not in heaven. Torah is no longer in heaven. We have, but the, this political divide, which is created when you give this power to the rabbis, it's something which is very dangerous. It's very dangerous to have this division within the rabbis, to have this machloket. 
So the Talmud is describing that, and uh, somehow we'll see what see what happens with this with this anger. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Sages taught. Sages taught there was a great anger on, on that day, as any place that Rabbi Elijah fixed his uh, his gate was burned. Wow, okay. have you heard that before? Uh, that's right, he started fires. Rabbi Eliezer, wherever he looked, wherever he looked, he started a fire. It's like laser eyes. So, how, how can we... What, which, sorry. I think I am I don't know that movie. Yeah. So, um, how little can we take... It's a good question. How little, right? Do you really think one-third of the entire world was afflicted. It could be that there was a plague that the, you know that, and and the, the rabbis are giving it a spiritual uh, explanation. explanation. It could be that it was. A, it could be that it's a metaphor. It could be they're trying to tell us that this is affecting the entire, not only the Jewish world, but affecting the entire world. And this Rabbi Eliezer has the power to burn. What do they th- they say? Machloket is like fire. Dispute. Unrest is like fire in a community. It can destroy. Fire is, is, is destructive. We're going to learn soon, <clears throat> uh, probably tomorrow even, we're going to learn another story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, because it's going to be like Baomer. And there is another similar expression. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you might have heard, he went into a cave. For many years, when he came out of the cave, I think he looked there was like 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 a laser or like a... it tur- it burned up. He burned up. He burned up everything that he looked at. It's the same expression. It's the same expression. I Meaning there's a, there's a there's some kind of a distance. There's some kind of a disharmony between the rabbi and the world. The rabbis are supposed to bring blessing to the world. The rabbi with his anger is not able to bring blessing to the world because he was so, uh, you know, uh, you can open it up, sure. Maybe those are fixed his gaze, was burned, okay. And even Rabbi Gabriel, the Nazi of the Sanhedrin, and Yavne, the head of the stages, who were responsible for the decision to ostracize Rabbi Gabriel, was coming on a boat at the time, and a large wave swelled over him. Oh, okay, so this connects us to our previous class. Who was Rabban Gamliel? Right? The head of the Sanhedrin, right? Yeah, please. You're going to make a bracha. Amen, amen, amen. Yofi. So Rabban Gamliel, the head of the Sanhedrin, he was going to die. Right? His boat, he was on a boat and there was the, 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 the wave was going to capsize the boat. And Rabbi Eliezer understood, Rabbi Gamliel understood. He said there's something strange going on in the world. It seems to me that, Go ahead. It seems to me that this is only for the sake of Rabbi Eliezer ben Hirakavos, as God punishes those who mistreat others. Stop there. We haven't been uh, given his full name yet. We've been just calling him Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. His full name was Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkanus. What does it sound like to you? Rabbi. Uh, Greek, Greek, right? So we're at the at the end of the. At this, we talked about the Greek period. Now we're in the Roman period, of course. But the but the the Greek names made their way into the Jewish people. Rabbi Yehazar ben Horkinus was was this great sage, and it's the we, Rabbi Gamliel is an understanding. He says maybe the rabbis went too far. It's one thing to say. Loba Shamaimi, the halacha is going to follow the majority. Do you have to excommunicate Rabbi Nezer? Do you really have to push it to that extreme? So it sounds like the heavens are upset. Go ahead. Rabbi Gamliel needs to protect the world. Nonetheless, go ahead. Rabbi Gamliel stood on his feet. Stood on his feet and said, Master of the universe, there is a real but known before you that neither was it for my honor that I acted when ostracizing him, nor was it for the honor of the house of my father that I that I acted. Rather, it was that I It was for your honor. 
so that disputes will not pro proliferate in Israel. In response, the sea calmed from its raging. Okay, stop there. So, Rabban Gamliel, he makes the case, he defends the rabbis, the other rabbis, obviously, and he says, we're not trying to split the Jewish people. We're not trying to be disrespectful to Rabbi Eliezer. We still appreciate his Torah, and we call him, Rabbi Akiva sat before him and says, I'm your student, but why did we do this? Why did, why did the rabbis make such a major political move to ostracize him? He says, so that... There was no, no division. No division. Exactly. It's not because we're trying to create division. We don't, it's the opposite. We're trying to keep the Jewish people together. If we don't have a system to decide disputes, if everybody's going to try to pull a miracle out of their uh, pockets, out of their sleeves, then it's not going to be a system which is sustainable. And so the reason why we, we made a point of pushing Rabbi Yezer aside is for the sake of unity, so that disputes will not proliferate in Israel. We want to keep the Jewish people together. We need a centralized authority, which is a system which can be followed for all generations. You have to follow the majority. And that explanation, that prayer of Rabban Gamliel, of course the Talmud is telling us that the sea calmed from its raging. It was accepted upon heaven. Again, this whole tension why did they reject Rabbi Yezra? They said, you can't, you know, create changes in nature and miracles and accept them as giving you authority. And yet, when Rabbi Gamliel needs help, like he, he does, he prays, he and the result, though, is that the physical world, the sea calms down from its rage, and we seem to take that as an indication that the explanation was accepted, that God agreed. So the, the, the tension is here, and it's very um, what, difficult. The message for, for us? The message for us is we, we need to have this system of the rabbis, following the majority of the rabbis, even if there are some, of course, it's, it's painful for Rabbi Eliezer and for the world, Ultimately, we have to have that system of lo bashamayim It's not in the heavens. The rabbis have the, the majority of the rabbis have the authority, and this seems to be uh, a sign that the sea calmed. Rabbi Gamliel was safe. Okay, now we have more of the story. It's, uh, it's just, uh, it's uh, beautiful the way the, the sages uh, continue to tell the story. Go ahead, uh, David. What? Mm. What? <laughs> the two camps, the two fighting camps. We have Rabbi Gamaliel who's the head of the Zmanasi, who's of course the, the, the person who's uh, the, the head of the academy where all the rabbis, and they just ostracized Rabbi Eliezer. His wife was the, uh, uh, the sister, the sister of Rabbi Gamaliel. Oh, family drama, absolutely. <laughs> so what happens here? Go ahead. From that incident forward, she would not allow Rabbi Eliezer to lower his head and recite Tachanun prayer, which includes supplication and entreaties. She feared that where her husband would be, yeah, where her husband to be bemoan, her faith and pray at that moment, her brother would be punished. So stop that. So... You all know that there's different sections of the uh, prayer service. The Shema, the Berakot HaShachar, Psukhet Zimra. Then there's a section of the Amidah. We all know that's the highlight, the pinnacle, right? The silent Shwan Esrei. And right afterwards, what? Tachanun. Did you say Tachanun this morning? Yes. Did you say Tachanun yesterday? No. Why not? Ah, yeah. Pesach Sheni, oh, right. So... I had a second chance to celebrate Pesach. Good. So every day we say Tachanun. According to this passage, it sounds like during the Tachanun prayer, 
very, uh, it's a very uh, powerful pr part of the prayer. Sounds like maybe it's a time for personal supplications and entreaties. You have, a, you don't, maybe, I don't know, in those days where they were reciting a text or not, but Rabbi Eliezer's wife felt that his, his prayers during the Tachanun would be more uh, significant or more, more listened to. The most dangerous of his prayers would be in Tachanun. And maybe in Tachnun he would really, uh, it's a moment of, of personal reflection, and maybe he would be uh, so moved at that moment to take stock and to realize and to be upset, to let his, let his anger come out against the other rabbis. And the head of the other rabbis, of course, is her brother, Rabbi Eliezer's wife, Ima Shalom, interesting name. Ima Shalom, Shalom being peace. She was afraid that Rabbi Eliezer would be uh, destroying the family, her bro the brother of peace, if you will. And so she didn't let him say Tachnun. Whenever she saw that he was finished, she wanted to say, right away she called him over, I need your help in the kitchen. <laughs> Come on over here, take the garbage out. She didn't let him say Tachnun because she didn't want him to pray for her brother to die. This was the, the adversary within the family. So now what happened? Uh-oh, uh-oh, what happened? A certain day. A certain day was her own day of the new moon, and she inadvertently substituted a full 30-day month for this efficiency, efficient 29-day month. Uh, that is, i.e., that, that is. is. She thought that it was a new moon. <gasps> Ah, she didn't say, okay, now I don't have to call him away from the prayer services for Tachnon, because he's not going to say Tachnon. Why? Because it's Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh will say Tachnon. Turns out she was wrong. It wasn't um, Rosh Chodesh. Um, I'm not exactly the most observant person of things happening, but if someone were to interrupt me at exactly the same point in my davening every single day, except in the days where I don't say the next portion of the davening, I would become a little bit suspicious. Suspicious or not, if your wife calls you, <laughs> you better go, right? <laughs> Rabbi Gamaliel was called out. She didn't let him. I don't know exactly whether she called him or whatever it was, but this is the way the Talmud tells this, 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 uh, this story to indicate how, how sensitive this issue was. Rabbi Eliezer was a powerful spiritual man we're all afraid of his, of his prayers, of his anger. And um, she tried to avoid it. Fascinating how, you know, she got the day wrong, the day of Rosh Chodesh. What a, what a twist. So what happened? Okay, we're in the middle. What happened? So she didn't take care that uh, he doesn't say Tachnun. Yeah, when one person always had but it was not. Some say that a pauper came. Uh, what's <coughs> Some say that a pauper a is a poor person. <coughs> Wait, what's that? A poor person. Ah, Some say the, the story was not Rosh Chodesh and that she didn't uh, pay attention, but rather there was another reason that she left. She wasn't paying attention to when he was davening. And uh, he's going to be able to say the Tachnun unsupervised is the problem. Uh, some people say a, po a poor person came and stood at the door and she... And she uh, took bread out of him. The result was that she left her husband momentarily unsupervised. When she returned, she found him and saw that he had lowered his head and prayed. She said to him, Arise, you already killed my brother. Wow, 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 wow. Was, uh, she was sure that her husband was such a powerful... Uh, Miracle worker, as we saw at the beginning of the passage, Rabbi Lezer had a very close relationship with God, and he, his anger, to uh, if he lets it, if he lets it loose, uh, he could w would kill her brother. And what happened? Did it happen? Meanwhile, the son of Shufar emerged from the house of Rabban Gamliel to announce that the Nasi had died. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Go ahead. Okay. Rabbi Eliezer said to her. But when did you know that your brother would die? She said to him, This is the tradition that I received from the house of the father of my father. All the gates of heaven are apt to be locked, except for the gates of prayer for victims of verbal mistreatment. Wow. 
Okay, so she was so convinced, she knew, she, she had this tradition that one of the worst sins possible that's going to bring destruction upon or punishment upon the perpetrator um, is this, this uh, excommunication. The fact that they, they couldn't get along with Rabbi Eliezer and they shunned him aside and he was so hurt, so hurt, that all he had to do was pray the Tachan and lower his head and Rabbi Gamliel died. Wow. So this is a, this is a classic piece. Primarily people read the beginning of it, but uh, you know this whole uh, principle that we don't follow the divine uh, uh, voice from heaven. We follow the majority of the rabbis. But the ending, I think, is particularly apt when it comes to leading up to Lagba Omer and the discussion that we have about the peace among, uh, you know, take, showing respect to each other. And uh, among the, the scholars in particular, right, the students of Rabbi Akiva apparently didn't learn this story enough. And they... Uh, this read almost like a Shakespearean drama. Like it very easily seems to be being faded through Shakespearean drama. It's so a, it's a great, uh, it's a great Midrash. <coughs> Excuse me. So, was, Could be he just complained, just complained to heaven about you know the the, the adversaries. And, and that's enough that Hashem says, mm -hmm. okay, you know, yeah. Sounds a little bit okay. okay. Harsh. Uh, Harsh. Yeah. Harsh. There must be something else going on before. Could be Rabban oh, was it such a severe um, split or um, decision by the, by the rabbis to excommunicate him? Listen, it, it, the, the Talmud throughout, it sounds like, who's the hero here? Who's, who's in the right and who's in the wrong? Well, I'd say the rabbis are in the right ones because in the end, Hashem uh, says, you learned, you learned your lesson, you, um, you, uh, you succeeded over me, or something like that. You triumphed over me, my children. Right, my children, it's fully by now, you triumphed over me, right? So it seems that they are the only right side, the protagonist. Okay. The other is so is the antagonist, the yes. destruction and... Um, the That's right, he kills Rabban Gamaliel. Yes. He kills Rabban Gamaliel in the end. His wife, even if his wife can't stop him. However, it sounds like that there is a um, tremendous price. Tremendous price. And, and uh, is there criticism? Is there criticism? The ending, the story with the Ima Shalom, saying that I have a tradition that the gates of the victims of verbal mistreatment are never closed. God, God listens to those who are mistreated. So it sounds like they, they were mistreating with So it sounds that he was also right. He was right, definitely. Or I'll put it this way. Maybe the rabbis were right, but there's a price for this power politics. There's a price for really uh, pushing Rabbi Eliezer so far out and excommunicating him. It's one thing to say that the Allah is not like him. Why did they have to excommunicate him? Why did they have to mistreat him so uh, publicly? And uh, there's, a, there's a price to that. There's a price to that. But it's, it's a fascinating Gemara, which shows both sides. It shows, uh, on the one hand, there's, there's, there's so much tension here. Number one, who is the protagonist, who's the antagonist? Who's, who's the, the hero? Who's right and who's wrong? Number two, do we listen to the heavens? Or we do not listen to the heavens. Tremendous power to Rabbi Eliezer's prayer, to his ability to do miracles. In the end, they work. And yet, um, 
uh, the rabbis say, oh, we're not going to follow. We're not going to follow those, that, that uh, mystical uh, intervention. And then they, they themselves bring the story of not, Rabbi Nathan telling that he met Eliyahu. And Eliyahu was telling him that God said, my children have triumphed over me. So their triumph is, is sourced by a mystical vision. So we have tension within this, um, within this story. Rabbi Akiva, wearing black. Rabbi Nezer himself, he accepted it, wearing black. But the, uh, uh, the halacha remains. Essentially, we, what we learn from this, the bottom line is that most uh, authorities interpret this that, And the Rambam, pr- primarily, we're going to see that another time. He says that uh, the bottom line is we don't follow the mystical visions. We don't uh, decide halacha by miracles. We follow. It's no longer in the heavens. No longer, perhaps in the time when there was a prophet. There was more room for that. But now, when we have no prophecy, the sages have the power. The sages decide. And that power is very dangerous. That's what another conclusion of this midrash is. That this power... He is very dangerous. It could um, destroy the crops, the wheat, the barley, the olives. Even what a woman has already needed, the dough, could be destroyed. And uh, families can be destroyed. Leaders can die. And um, people, uh, the mistreating of, of the other scholars is a danger behind uh, you know, part of part of this tremendous power is the danger that it can cause within society the politics. Okay, good. So we're moving ahead. We're starting to uh, enter the the world of the sages. We've learned some of the first protagonists, Rabbi Gamliel. We heard about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Eliezer now, and Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Eliezer being from the Shammai school, Rabbi Yeshua obviously, and the other rabbis from the Hillel school. I'd like to uh, move ahead with you, and um, there's a few other stories about uh, that that will really show us some of what was going on in the period of the sages. The stories of Rabbi Akiva you might have heard of, and of course the stories of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, because Lagba Omer is coming. Before we do that, I'm going to try to see if I can... Uh, if I can get the uh, the movie going, because the movie really uh, shows us this, the previous story, that, that the beginning of this period. They, um, but before we, uh, so we'll, we'll take a little break in a few minutes. But what I want to show you is the uh, a broad brushstrokes what's going on in the sage, period of the sages. Yeah. Uh, what we what that's like the story with the students is the same one. Right? Same one. Oh, okay. Same one. So same one. one. So let me uh, just uh, schematically put this on the board for you. Um, sorry. Yes. What about the first rabbis? Those are not from this period. That's later. Shmuel? Yeah. In the very, very beginning. What does it say? The first one. The second one. Ah, yeah. Shmuel. Shmuel. So let's let's figure out who is Rav Yehuda in the name of Shmuel. Who are these people? I'm assuming this is later on. This is later on. This is later on. This is later on. So basically, we're talking about the period now from year zero, we said year to year five hundred, right? So, uh, we call them the sages. Another word for that is the, uh, in Hebrew, Chachamim, <laughs> right? Zichronam Levracha Chet Zayn Lamed spells Chazak. Exactly. 
אוקיי? חז"ל, חכמים זיכרונם לברכה, וחכמינו, our sages, mm-hmm. um, so this is what we've been chastering the sages. Now, usually, um, we spoke about, before this period, we spoke about the pairs, right? <coughs> the last of the pairs being Hillel and Shammai, right? Yes. And then we said that essentially Rabban Gamliel was uh, the uh, son of Hillel. And so he took over now. So when we talk about year zero, we usually split up this, this period because we don't have, we're not going to spend you know, all, all year on this period of the sages. What do we do? We study the words of uh, sages just like we study the words of the Tanakh, right? Because they, eventually, the words of the sages started to get recorded. Right? If the Tanakh was canonized, if the Tanakh was completed in the Second Temple era, so there's no more books going to be written? Or really, you're not supposed to write any more books. There's the written Torah, and then there's the oral Torah. So everything else was oral. For a long time, all the commentary, all the discussions of the Tanakh, all, this, all these traditions that we had was all oral. The rabbis during this period uh, were so productive, and there was one rabbi. So at year zero, we start with... Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, and he um, saved the rabbis at Yavne, right? Mm-hmm. And primarily, together with uh, who did he save? The the Rabban. Who remembers what Rabban stands for? Why does he have a funny name, Rabban? All the other rabbis are called Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi. He's Rabban. Gamliel, good. Why? Because he was the Nasi, the Nasi, the president or the, it's a special title. Rabban is a special title only given to the Nasi, okay? So the Nasi is, uh, you know, the, the president of, of the, the, the leadership, the leadership of uh, the Jewish people at that time. So this is uh, <coughs> the first generation of the Tanaim. Now, I'm going to use words here that are very important. We're going to be using them as we go through the period. This period is usually divided up into two. The period of the sages. We have names for the earlier sages and the later sages. And the names are Tanaim. Very good. I don't know which one in this one. Right, 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 right. Tanaim and the, the first one? earlier sages are Tanaim. Right. And the later sages are Rishon. Amoraim. <laughs> no, don't get confused because Rishonim are right, right. you know a thousand years later. <clears throat> okay? That's from year 1000 to 1500. We're talking about 0 to 500. It's exactly 1,000 years later. What is the difference between the Tanaim and the Morim? So it's about, the, the, the cutoff date is around the year 200. Okay, so the uh, first 200 years, we call them the Tanaim. <coughs> the second 200, uh, 300 years, uh, continues a little more, are called the Amorim. What's the difference between the two? <coughs> the difference primarily, and this is, this is really fascinating, I, I studied this, Sorry? That's on Wikipedia. It shows the... Good, good, good. Good, good. Yes, of course. Uh, these, these are used. But um, again, this is all... The way I'm describing it is that this is all considered to be the period of, of Chazal, the period of the sages, the green era. But the green era gets divided into two. Maybe we should make them different colors, but uh, uh, let's keep it simple. Okay. What is the major difference? There was a scholar here who lived. There was five generations between years zero, it's about 50 years each, or 40 years each generation, the, 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 the great scholar who lives at year 200, Hillel the Elder. Hillel the Elder was up here. We said he was one of the pairs. Ah, oh, okay. Was right? Hillel was, was before. Rabbi Akiva and Yehuda the Nasi. Ah, so you're, you're mixing up things. Rabbi Akiva, we just mentioned. Mm-hmm. But you did get it right that Rabbi Yehuda Ha-nasi. What does nasi mean? 
means that he was the... Uh, we just said, Nasi, the, right? The president Rabbi Gamaliel was the Nasi. The president, the president of the Sanhedrin, no? President of the Sanhedrin. If you can also say president. Yes, president of the Sanhedrin. Nasi is. He was a descendant from, from Rabbi Gamaliel. He was a descendant, yes. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, Rabbi Gamaliel's name was, uh, son's name was Shimon, known as Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, and his son's name was Gamliel. So there was another Rabban Gamliel. And then his son was Shimon. So there was another Shimon ben Gamliel, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. Finally, he had a son whose name was Yehuda. And this is Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who was perhaps the last, the last of the official Nisi'im. And we'll, we'll talk more about what happened afterwards in just a minute. Why do we say that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is the cutoff? He's the last of the Tana'im. So he was the last Nasi. Was there was Nasi. others after him, but <clears throat> he was the last Tana. Everything after Rabbi Yehuda Nasi are no longer considered to be Tanaim. Right? This is this is plural, of course, singular. So is, is this, this where, is the, plural. where we lost the Smicha, the extra Smicha? Uh, close, close. Might be connected to that, but uh, not absolute. Uh, Tana is singular, and this is also plural, and Amora is the singular. Okay? <clears throat> so, why do we call them these, these rabbis Tanaim and then afterwards Amoraim? There is. Uh, so they composed the Mishnah. Excellent. Because the word so Tanaim. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's good. It's good to. to, to, to uh, to be on the ball. It's good. You can learn a lot from Wikipedia. Yeah. But to know how to put it all together is what we're hopefully uh, figuring out here. Uh, the word Tana, I want to write it out here for you in, in Hebrew. It's actually Aramaic. The truth is, Tana, and that's usually written with an Aleph at the end, it's a sign of Aramaic. Okay? Taf no no. Okay. But whether it's an Aleph or He is insignificant right now. The point is, what is the root? So there's a phenomenon that um, the, the taf, the letter taf, is with the shin. in Aramaic is, shin. is a replacement for the shin in Hebrew. Shin nun he. Shin nun he. Hmm. So shana, what does shana mean? Here. Shana, we all know, has one meaning which means shana tova. Rosh Hashanah, Shana is a year. It's also, it's also Shnai. Year is a, right? Shnai, very good. A year. Why is it called a year? Shana, because it's a cycle. It gets repeated. Oh, like Mishnah also. And so the, the, the word in the Shema, what do we say every day in the Shema? Right? Vayud Vayim Hashem Hashem Tzavcha Yom Alav Adacha Veshinantam Lebanecha What does that mean? Teach them to your sons. Repeat them to your sons. Le shanen means to repeat. So shana means repeat. So mm -hmm. basically, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, at this point, we're talking about, right there, let's just fill in a little bit. If this is the first generation of Tanaim, second generation is Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua. We just read about them. Who was the student? Rabbi Akiva. Third generation is Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva. Fourth generation is the students of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Right. We know that he had 24,000 students and they died. Uh, he was his, there was five uh, left. He restarted uh, the, the tradition one more time. And of these five students, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, is the one we're uh, speaking about this week. Of course, there's Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda and many others. And the fifth generation is here, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. 
Okay, Uranasi is the fifth generation of, of, of Tanaim. So we have this whole uh, chain of tradition, five, ge five generations of Tanaim. There's many more in each one. Why do we know so much about them? Why do we have all these... Where, where are the, all their words recorded? Not only Pirkei Avot. is one small Masech out of 63. One out of 63. Okay. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi decided to do something never done before. And he said, we have to... Exactly. We have to create... We're going to create a book. Mishnah. Uh, the Mishnah. That's going to collect all of the teachings that up to this day are repeated. How would they study them? Memorizing them. All of the words of the sages that have to get repeated, we call them, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi made a book. He called it the Mishnah. It's actually, how many, how many parts did it have? Six. Right, he, he called them the six orders of the Mishnah. Six orders. Shisha Sidre Seder. He calls it on order. It's like a, a section. Six orders of the Mishnah and all of the Tanaim, all of these words of these five generations of Tanaim, including also Hillel and Shammai, as we saw a little bit, and Ramang Amliel and Rabbi Lezer, I'm sure. All these words are recorded in the Mishnah. The words of the Tanaim. Where does the word Tana come from? From the word Mishnah. So the Tanaim are only the sages here that were recorded in the Mishnah. Once Rabbi Huda Nasi wrote the book, collected the book, edited the book, however you want to understand it, there's a debate amongst the scholars. The next generations are not going to be Tanaim. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be in the Mishnah. You can't come afterwards. Right? You can't say that... Uh, President Obama, as great as he was, he's not going to be signed on the Declaration of Independence. It's impossible. <clears throat> Unless you can do time travel, it's just not going to happen. So the Amoraim are not mentioned in the Mishnah. The Tanaim are all those scholars which their words are collected in the Mishnah. And that's where we get to Tanaim. Tana is somebody stated in the Mishnah. Yes? Rabbi Yudah Hanasi is a student of Rabbi Shimon Baruch yes? No. No. Uh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. yes. So Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is number five. <laughs> yes. The okay. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, the uh, chart is a little unclear, but yes. Because I had the year 200 there, so I couldn't put the five. Yes, yes. So in the um, Amorayim period? We'll get there. to that in a minute. Okay. That comes later. Let's focus on the Tanaita period first. Okay. That's the first half of the period of the sages, the green, which we have to fill in one day, soon. Okay? Green? The green era, the fourth yeah. era. The today? But the Amorim are also in the group. We'll finish today. When we finish. The, we'll the finish. Amorim are also in the group. Also in that group. They're also in the group. All the way to year 500. We just didn't. We didn't get there yet. We're still in the Tanai. There's so much to learn about the Tanai. As we say, the beginning of the period is fascinating. There's the destruction of the temple, right? Year 70. <laughs> right in here. Right? At year 70, we know that there was a major turn of events in the, the dealing with the Roman Empire. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, I need a key. Uh, okay, so give him the key. Okay. So, uh, this book, I have to tell you a little bit about Rabbi Yehuda Nasi and this book called the Mishnah. So, the Talmud were the last one to, um, to um, teach the. Uh, I wouldn't say it that way. I'd say that the, the process continues. That as we as we continue, the words of the sages start to get written down at around the, in this period, this period called the period of the sages. We start to have collections of their work. As Moshe indicated before, it actually is a major revolution because really it's prohibited. You're not allowed to write down the oral Torah. It's why it's called the oral Torah. It has to be oral. You're not allowed to write it down. We needed somebody with broad shoulders like Rabbi Yehuda 
Judah the prince, sometimes he's called. He made that major change. It could be, you know what? It could be that before that people did write down, the Rambam indicates that people wrote down there, if you're trying to memorize something and you have paper of some form and a pen, you need some hints, some mnemonic devices. There were apparently private collections People writing down notes, writing down Mishnayot, what we now call Mishnayot. What singular is Mishnah, plural Mishnayot. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi decided to bring it out to the public, put it on the table, and create a formalized book, a canon. Now, this book that he made was, was such a revolution, not only because it was prohibited until his day. There was supposed to be only one book of Judaism, the Tanakh, the written book. Huda Nasi, so this was innovation number one. He says, we need another book. We need, we need to write down all this oral stuff, or it's going to get lost, as we're going to speak about in the coming well, days. Uh, that's right, we're going to discuss in the, few, in the next few days what the Roman Empire was doing in, during this period. We know that Rabbi Kiva's flesh was torn off with, with combs, iron combs, right? They were persecuted here during this period. Rabbi Akiva, right? Generation number three. Rabbi Shem Bar Yechai hiding out in a cave. They weren't allowed to study Torah. Rabbi Yudha Nasi sees what going on. 24,000 students dying, whether it was a plague or a revolt, whatever it was. The, the scholars were under duress. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, he made the call, and he actually lived in a time of relative prosperity. And he was therefore able, he was a very rich man, Rabbi. He had a nickname, by the way. I don't know if I, I put this uh, in here. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi had a nickname. Rebbe. Exactly. Uh, Rebbe, as we said, nowadays Rebbe has become a title. Some people call me Rebbe. Right? <laughs> no, he was Rebbe. It's hard to, there's different pronunciations. I think in the Sephardi world they pronounce Rabbi, in the Ashkenazi world they pronounce Rebbe. I don't know which is one is correct or, or not correct, but this is unique. There is many, uh, where, what do we say? Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Hudasi was so great. Rabbi, Rabbi. It was, it's interesting, he was not called Rabban, even though he was an Asi. Yeah. He, he got his own title, Rabbi, Rabbi or Rabbi, whichever one you want, but without any name. It doesn't, not, we don't call him Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda, somebody else. He was a, a partner of, of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. There's somebody called Rabbi Yehuda, who was one of the primary students of Rabbi Akiva. So don't get confused. This is Rabbi Yehuda and this is Rabbi Yehuda and Asi, two separate people. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, therefore, is usually not either referred to by the entire title, his full name, or he's just called Rebbe without any name afterwards. If you see Rebbe without any name afterwards, it refers to Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Such a major figure. So he had the, also the, he had the funds, he had the wherewithal, he had the peace after hundreds of years, 200 years here of, under the Roman uh, persecution, he said, I'm going to write all this stuff down. So that was number one revolution. Second revolution of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, and this is really, uh, what do you say, uh, holy chutzpah? <laughs> he needed holy chutzpah to go against the tradition and recognize we have to write it down. We have to make another book. The book of the Tanakh is not good enough. We can't only, we have to have a collection of the writings of the sages, of the teachings of the sages. We have to collect them in writing. So that was innovation number one. Innovation number two. Uh, and this is just uh, mind-blowing. Until today, until today we use Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's system over and above the system of the Tanakh. What do I mean? I mean, what did we say the, the name of his book was? Mishnah. Six Sidre Mishnah. Six orders of the Mishnah. Mishnah. 
Which means, you know what he did? He said, no more are we going to talk about, you know, when we were, up, up until his day, when you wanted to discuss, or if you wanted to uh, maybe write a book. Now, there were some other books. Another book, other books written at the time were called Midrashim. It's the same rabbis. Wow. Same rabbis. What's the difference between Midrash and Mishnah? So no, but a lot of people think it's thematically. So so they they relate to the same material. The the scholars here were talking about the Tanakh. They were talking about the halachic sections. They were talking about the agadic sections. They were talking about the history. The difference is primarily the order. The order. The midrash are all written sort of like commentary. There's a midrash on Shmot, there's a midrash on... So if you wanted to uh, write down uh, the laws of Shabbat, for example, you'd go look in the Torah, where does the Torah mention Shabbat? And that's where you find the laws of Shabbat. And if you want to learn about the laws of uh, Truma and Maser, right, the tithes of the agriculture, the laws of Shemitah, okay? Last week's Parsha. You would go and open up Parshat Behar, and you'd have a Midrash. A Midrash which is written on Parashat Behar. In other words, in the Midrash, the order remains the same. The, the organizing structure is the 24 books of the Bible. There's Midrash on Tehillim. These are get written, get written later. But what, what defines it as Midrash, as opposed to the six orders of the Mishnah, is the, the uh, organizational structure. It's sort of like a commentary. There's a Midrash on the Psukim, Midrash on Shmuel, Midrash on, on, uh, on, uh, on the, the book of Bamidbar. And there's different kinds of Midrash. There's Midrash which speak about Halakha and agada. These are two terms which I, w- I need you to learn as well. Uh, Halakha, of course, is legal material. What does agada mean? It's a story. story. Everything else. It could be stories. It could be history. It could be. Uh, it could be um, uh, ethics. Yes. Like pirkevot. So. If it, Pekavot is a part of the Mishnah. But you have Midrashim, which are full of ethical, uh, you know, um, ideas that the rabbis wanted to share with us. They're going to be in something called Midrash Agada. So there's two types of Midrash. But again, the major distinction is that the Midrashim are written and collected using the book. The only book we're supposed to have, which is the 24 books of the Bible, the Tanakh. Along came Rebbe, and he said, first of all, okay, we have to write things down. Okay, other people wrote things down in the Midrash, too. Okay, there are other people that collected uh, Midrashim, is the plural. What was so unique about what Rebbe did, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi did, Rebbe, what he did, was that not only did he write down oral teachings about the Jewish tradition, He created a brand new structure, right? If we have the five books of Moses and the 24 books of the Bible, right? Chumash, Chumash, the word five, Chamesh, the five books of Moses, and we have the the 24 books of the Tanakh, along came Rebbe, and we have a new number in Judaism. The new number we said is six. There are six categories of Jewish tradition. And this is brand new creation. A brand new system of categorization. For example, when you want to know about the laws of Shabbat, don't go look up. You know, the Shvi'it, don't go look up the laws of the seventh year, the sabbatical year, Shemitah. Don't look in Parshat Bahar. Where are you going to look? You're going to look in the order about agriculture. There's an entire category, the laws of agriculture. And if you want to learn about Shabbat, don't go look in Parshat Bashalach and in Parshat uh, Vayakel. Look in the order about the festivals. 
Shabbat is put there at the beginning of the festivals. And if you want to learn about the laws of divorce, you won't look in the Torah where the divorce is mentioned and the laws of forbidden relationships and permitted relationships. Don't look in Parshat Kadoshim like we just read last week or two weeks ago. That, you know, what are the forbidden relationships? Where are you going to look? Well, there's a book called The Laws of Women. Nashim. Nashim. And it's in there. So Rabbi Yehud Anasi was such a revolutionary. Not only that he wrote things down, because as you're getting the idea, things started to get written down. They needed to write things down or they'd get lost with all the persecutions. They're written down in the form of Midrash. They're written down even in the forms of individual uh, teachings. But to put them together in a brand new structure, instead of 24 books of the Bible, now we have six orders of the Mishnah. Those six orders have 63 books within them. So you, it's almost 60. So you could say it's like you know, 10 for each order, so 60. So instead of 24 books, we have 60 books, all uh, compiled and created by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. And this is really um, a revolution that we used until today. Till today, which system is most commonly used when you want to discuss Jewish tradition? We look things up according to the order that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi made most collections of, of uh, studies, research about topics, they're going to follow the organizational chart that Rabbi Yehuda and Asi made up, these six orders. And we'll discuss what they are in just a minute. Moshe, thank you for waiting. Midrash comes exclusively from Chazal, or does it also come from before? So when to start Chazal is a little bit uh, tricky business, because, you know, there's the pairs. The pairs... We, we, we know they started earlier, in the Second Temple period, right? But they're, they're still sort of part of Chazal. It's also tricky when to end them. The Amoraim, we're going to see that there's, there's other sages after, after the times of the Mishnah. They're also part of Chazal. And um, so... I, I was telling you, but generally speaking, does Midrash come from Chazal? Yes. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. And everything on the board, everything we're discussing today is the green period. Right. Sorry? It comes from both the Tanaim and the Amoraim. Correct, correct. It, the majority of the time period of Chazal is Tanaim and Amoraim. The first 200 years, the latter, two, 300, 400 years. And, but some, we also have words from the pairs, the, the Zugot. From before the pre-Tanaitic era, right? Words of we have words maybe from the unshakeness of the law, right? When we say Shimon Tzadik, Hayami Shere Unshakeness of the we quoted from him in Pirkeavot. So we have some of the the pairs. We don't have too much of their teachings in actual written uh, formulations. That's why primarily when we say Chazal, we mean Tanaim and Amoraim. Okay. Another question? Another comment? So far? Yeah, so what, what yeah. did Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi compile? Like what, what, it's just a system. But like... He compiled the book called the Mishnah, or the Six Orders of the Mishnah. Uh, okay. Okay? So it's a book. Rabbi it's Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. You can't say Rabbi Yehuda, because there's, there's two. There's, I said, then I said, that would be Rabbi Yehuda. It's either Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi or Rabbi. Rabbi Yehuda, just the regular one came after, yeah? No, before. He was, he was a student of Rabbi Akiva. Then it, what you're reading in this, you're confused by this because notice, we'll get to, get to the Amoraim in just a minute. What is his title? In line two? What does it say? Rav Yehuda. That's somebody else. <laughs> Rav Yehuda. But we're going to see that in the Amoraic period, we're going to have a split between Babel or Babylon and the land of Israel. Up until now, all of the Jewish scholarship, primarily what we have, the words of the Tanaim, they're all from the land of Israel. In the Amoraic period, we're going to have two centers. Now, in Israel, they continue to call themselves uh, Rabbi, just like the truth is, we have Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. There's a Rabbi Yochanan here. He was not ben Zakkai. 
he was in the first generation of Amoraim. But he's, and then we have other scholars in each generation. In Eretz Yisrael, they're still going to be called Rabbi, but in Bavel, they get a new title. It's Rav. So when we speak here about Rav Yehuda, uh, he is the second generation. Uh, Rav Yehuda is not Rabbi Yehuda or Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. It's a third fellow. <laughs> Yehuda is a popular name. It's a very Jewish name. Right. Yehuda meaning Jew, Judah, right? Jew, Judea, Jew, Jew. The word Jew might come from the word Yehuda. Anyway, so there's a lot of Yehudas. But one trick that we can look at to know the difference is, what's the trick? You're learning already. If his moniker is Rav, mm -hmm. he's an Amora from the Babylon. If his moniker is Rabbi, he's probably a Tana. Yeah. And if his moniker is uh, just Rebbe, <laughs> then it's only Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. There's only one person. There's only one person. That's, that's the Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Okay? What's confusing is, so that's, that's, always look at the title. The title is, can signify the generational change and the geographical change. Bavel, Rav. Rav Yehuda. Right? Rav Huna. Rav uh, Nachman. Lots of Amoraim that have the title Rav because they lived in Bavel. They lived in Babylon. When the title is Rabbi, we know that they're from the land of Israel. Now here is where you have to know a little bit because it's confusing. Rabbi Yochanan, he was from the land of Israel, but he's in Amora. So you can't tell from the moniker whether it's a Tana or an Amora in the land of Israel. You can't tell. So you just have to know. You have to know your, your, your Jewish lineage. There's not an exception. It's just that the, all of the Amoraim in Eretz Yisrael continued with the title Rabbi. Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi uh, Yoshia, Rabbi uh, Zutra. Right? There's lots of uh, Rabbis, but they're Amoraim. That's because they're after the year 200. They're after the Mishnah's times. But they're still called Rabbi. Just like Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer. So you can't know everything from the moniker, from the title, okay? Lots of stuff, lots of good stuff here, huh? Wow. Now I'll just complete the, uh, the framework and then we're gonna go back and do some details. But we understood why the Tanaim are called Tanaim, right? Why? Tana? The shtaf switches into a shin, right? So it's like the mishna, mishnaim, right? The tanaim is like the mishnaim. It's like the shanaim, the people who, who uh, speak in the mishnah. The, the, the repeaters, that's right. The people who are part of... But in the end of the day, it comes down to all these people, are, their works are from the, this foundational period. Their works are recorded in the Mishnah. Now, for some reason, the Mishnah and this entire period that's so critical for Chazal, it became treated in our tradition like gold. The Amoraim people who came later, they were so respectful. And they took it so seriously. This Mishnah, it became like a canon, just like the Tanakh. You can't say, oh, Ezra said X, Y, Z, and Moshe Rabbeinu wrote uh, such and such. I think differently. I disagree with Ezra. I disagree, I disagree with what the prophet Tzaphania said. You can't do that. You're not a prophet. You're not on the same level. It became... The given standard, Amoraim took it upon themselves, even though it's not really written in any law anywhere. The Amoraim took it upon themselves and they said, we don't have the power. We don't have the authority, right? What did we speak about the authority of the sages? It's almost like 
everything above this line, all the words of the Tanaim, we cannot dispute with. The Moraim are, doesn't have the power to argue against a Tana. An Amora cannot argue against a Tana. This is a standard part of our tradition. There's a solid line here. The works of the Tanaim, where are they recorded? In the Midrash and in the Mishnah. All of these works of the first 200 years of the periods of the sages are on a pedestal. They're on a very powerful position, much more than the Amoraim. The Amoraim afterwards are going to come, they're going to continue the discussion. Their words are even going to be recorded, but they're never going to go head to head against a Tana. They don't have the power to. Only a Tana can disagree with another Tana. An Amora, he can interpret, he can interpret, he can explain that Tana didn't mean that, but he would never uh, go ahead and say, he says X, I think he's wrong, and I think Y. Yeah. They didn't have the power. They accepted that the words of the Tanaim are like gold. Okay? Yeah. So from where comes this, 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 this rift, this, this clear uh, distinction between the Tanaim and the Amora? Nobody the really knows. Happens. Nobody really knows. There, there is a tradition that maybe they had like a, a gathering, like in the times of Ezra. We said that they gathered all the people, they made a covenant of the Lord, and they all accepted upon themselves to... They read from the Torah, and they accepted upon themselves the Torah. Some people think they actually had, here, at the end of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi's days, they had a similar type of gathering, and they all made a decision. This is our uh, book, our new book, the book of the Mishnah, and we don't have uh, any more authority to to debate, to go against the words of the, the Holy Tanaim. Most people, most scholars assume that there was no such gathering. It was just um, maybe the force of their, 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 their uh, words, the power of their spirituality, the power of their intellect, the power of, the, of their stature was so great that all of the Amoraim, both in Babel and in Eretz Yisrael, they all realized we cannot argue against the Tanaim. We're going to interpret their words, we're going to discuss their words, we're going to continue discussing them, but we can't argue. You know what we're going to do if we want to, if you really want to say against, for example, the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, you're going to have to find a Rabbi Yehoshua. Because the Amoraim are going to be searching for all the different collections, all the different words of the different Tanaim, saying, Oh, you know why I disagree with Rabbi Akiva? Because I feel that I found a source. I found another source, another Mishnah, another Midrash, where Rabbi Ishmael says differently. Rabbi Ishmael can argue against Rabbi Akiva. I can't. But if I can find one of these building blocks, a Midrash or, 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 or a Mishnah, that includes the words of the Tanaim, then I can... I'm not disagreeing with the Tana. The Tana is agreeing with the disagreeing with the Tana. That's allowed. I want to add one more piece, and then I'll take uh, I'll take your questions. There's one other collection here. Now this is really uh, important when you start to study Talmud. When you start to study Talmud, um, well, I'll tell you what that is in a minute. <laughs> but when you're studying um, the words of the sages, there is another. Collection. So far we've spoken about Mishnah and Midrash. Collecting words of the Tanaim. There's one other book or collection. And this is called the Tosefta. Not to be confused with Tosfot. Tosefta. And that's the collection of the singular, it's made up of individual Braito, Braita. You might have heard the word before. What is a Braita? The word Bar means outside. What that means is that there were these are words of the same Tanaim, it's the same rabbi. Rabbi Huda Anasi created a book called the Mishnah. 
and he put in different words of the rabbis in Mishnah Aleph, Mishnah Bet, Mishnah Gimel, and so forth. But there were other, other words of the rabbis that didn't make it into the book. Mm. They were barred. They were outside. And, but their words are still collected. Their words were, they're called brightos. So Mishnayot, which didn't make it into the Mishnah, are called brightot. They're collected in books. There's a few different collections called the Tosefta. So basically, how, 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 how are they not, they were not in the Mishnah even though they're still written Because now. maybe there were different versions of the same uh, teaching, and Rabbi Yehuda Nasi felt that uh, this formulation that he put in his Mishnah is better than the formulation in the Brayta. So, yes, the Mishnah is more authoritative than the, than the Brayta. But many times, it's just additional material. Mm -hmm. It doesn't contradict anything. And it's the words of our holy Tanaim. So you know what the, the Amoraim do? They're searching for precedence, not only in the Mishnah and in the Midrash, the but also in the Brayta, in the Tosefta, which is a collection of Brayta. They're looking for any of the words of the Tanaim, which are the building blocks of the later discussions. And the last term that I'm going to say today before we do a review <laughs> is at the end, the words of the Amoraim were collected. Gemara, the word Gemara actually has the word Amora in it. Mora, similar. Gemara. What was the Gemara mean? Like the Gem? The truth is. Um, Gimel Memresh means to learn, and Amar, Aleph Memresh means to say, so learning and saying. Some people say that there's actually a, a two letter root. Memresh are the same, and the, the, there's no di major difference between Aleph and the Gimel at the beginning. But the point is, all of these discussions of the Gemara are the words of the Amorai, and they're discussing the words of the Tanaim in the Mishnah, in the Baraita, in the Midrash. They quote all of these. And this entire package, the words of the Tanaim, and the words of the Moraim, the, the Mishnah, together with the Gemara, is called Talmud. Okay, a lot of terms. A lot of people. Like the, One second, one, one at a time. We'll check and then, uh, yeah. Generally, we'd also consider later commentaries on the Gomorrah as also part of the as also part of the Talmud, but they're printed in the book. They're printed the book of the Talmud. Here we have it right in front of you. The Talmud Bavli. The Talmud, yeah. the Talmud Bavli. That's just a, a, a convention. The Talmud. Now there's two Talmuds. We'll get to that another day. Yeah. But the, the Talmud. You open it up, the standard page of the Talmud, the Talmud is actually only in the middle. Yeah, I'm talking about the stuff outside. on the outside. It comes it's from the later periods. Okay. Okay? So it's amazing. On one page, you have words from all oh, 3,500 years. Sometimes you have a Pasuk from the Torah. You're going to have a Pasuk from the Navi or the Ketuvi. Then you'll have maybe. Uh, uh, some of the words of the uh, pairs mm -hmm. you have on, and then you'll have the sages, you'll have a Mishnah, and a Brayta, Zugot, 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 and then sometimes on this margin you'll have a comment from one of the Gaonim, Rashi and Tosfot there are Mishonim, and on the same page you have the comments of the Gra, the Gaon of Vilna, who's one of the Aphronim. It's amazing, one page we have all these different generations of Jewish tradition uh, from 3,500 years. So we're going to get to this page of Talmud, but don't confuse so that. It's later, not part of the wait, Talmud. Later, the Talmud is only the middle part. Talmud is only the middle part. There's later commentaries in the margins, but that's not part of the Talmud. Correct. Even though it's printed in the book. Correct, even though it's printed in the book. Correct. <laughs> the book itself is actually a, a complex, uh, multi multi-generational uh, work, but the Talmud itself is only the stuff in the middle of the page. Do we yes. have a different term for this compilation of books we have nowadays, with the Talmud and the commentators of the Talmud? Uh, it's it's uh, just a particular format. 
which was created about 200 years ago, uh, which has become standardized. The, the, uh, the, the, the page of Talmud and the, with the commentaries on the sides, um, but there's no different name for it. It's just the standard way to pr print the Talmud. Talmud with its commentaries. Yeah. Oh, I, Ravid. I feel overloaded. Overloaded. I hear you. I hear you. It's a lot. It reminds me of the story of the last parasha Bahak with the uh, Hamor who is overloaded. Uh, <laughs> right. In Kadoshim, I think it was. Yeah. No, no problem. No problem. We're going to review this. This is, uh, of course, the first, the first presentation. We're going to go back over this and we're going to we're going to develop more. We have to learn more about the Mishnah. And, and more about the, the, uh, the Talmud, the Gemara, but uh, the structure of, of the sages, the period of the sages, is what we have here on the board here, okay? Two major sections, the Tanaitic period, the Amoraitic period, and so many innovations. So this is really the golden era of Judaism, if you ask me, the period of the sages. It's really the Judaism as we know it, and this is, I shock people sometimes. When they, people ask me, what is the major book of Judaism? Nine times out of ten, people will think the answer is the Tanakh, of course. And they're not wrong. But the Tanakh is part of, the, maybe it's the summary of the foundational period, right? Up until the Second Temple. Yeah. But then, during, after the Second Temple, during the period of the sages, in the first 500 years of the Common Era, Judaism exploded. It got its structure, it's got its, its character, and this is actually all recorded in the Talmud. The Talmud includes the words of the Mishnah, the words of the Gemara. The Talmud includes Halakha and Agadah, legal material, non-legal material, ethics, history, Everything. So the Talmud, perhaps, is the basic book of Judaism as we know it. It's very necessary to split it to understand all these periods and the combinations of these. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. That's what we're doing. We're trying to get a handle on Judaism. You could just say, "Oh, I." You know, many people they come, they they they're interested in Judaism. I want to convert. Uh, I love, I read the Tanakh. I read the Tanakh and it's just so true. They're not wrong. Tanakh is amazing. It's the word of God to the Jewish people. And then they get to uh, Yeshiva. <laughs> Say, Tanakh? That's not the major book of Judaism. The major book of Judaism is the Talmud. There's all this stuff. The Tanaim and the Amarim who took Judaism and developed it. It's like, Judaism, wow, that's such a, a beautiful fruit. You look at, uh, for example, a, uh, uh, a date, and you say, oh, that's amazing. That date is beautiful. Wait, but that date has to be taken in context. There's the, it grows on a beautiful tree with branches, and there's an entire grove of dates, and there's, there's so much more that's built around and beyond the simple, basic text of the Tanakh. Not that the Tanakh is simple in any way. The Tanakh, we could study the Tanakh our whole lives. If you want to study Judaism our whole lives, we have to study the Tanakh and also study the words of the sages from this, from this period, the period of the sages. Okay, the Tanaim and the Moraim. Other questions, comments on what we presented today? So what we did, I'll just review if there's no comments or questions. We started off with, you know, individual personalities. I told you a story about Rabban Yochanan Medzakai asking for Yavne and Rabban Gamliel, right? The Nasi. That was the story. We're going to see a movie about that period. The temple's going to be destroyed. As I said, temple's going to be destroyed. He says, I've got to create, make sure that the rabbis stay, even though the temple is destroyed. Today we saw, and yesterday a little bit, about how the rabbis worked within themselves. How this authority, right? The story of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yoshua, and not in heaven. 
and uh, Rabbi Akiva, the student, being there. There's a lot happening within this period. Finally, then we skipped and we jumped out from the individual stories and I showed you the structure. The structure that there's basically two parts. The first era created by Rabbi Yochanan Medzakai at the destruction. He said, these sages, what are these sages? The Yavne, what is Yavne? Yavne is all these Tanaim. The beginning of all these Tanaim. And five, five generations till year 200, Rabbi Yehud Anasi crystallizes all these teachings into a book. The book is the book of the Mishnah. We saw that there's other books too. There's the Midrash, there's Braita. But essentially the period of the Tanaim is the foundational period, the beginning of Chazal. After the, this, this, this uh, metal curtain, iron curtain, between the period of the Tanaim come the Amoraim who continue to debate and to search for and to quote all of the words of their predecessors for another, here I have it, 300 years. The truth is, let me just show you this. Take a look here on the board, guys. Look on the board. There was three, four, and then five generations of Amoraim in Eretz Israel, and then it stopped. And that's where we lost the... Uh... The Jewish community in the land of Israel could not survive anymore. It was, as it was, it was hard during the, the Roman era. The next 300 years, they still managed to have a community, but essentially the community ultimately was destroyed at around year 500. In Bavel, we have six, seven. We have another 200 years till around year 700 where the Amoraim continue. All the generations of Amoraim, we have scholars, until finally we have uh, the completion of the Amoraic period, probably closer to year 700. But we try to keep it simple with the you know, 500 year period. And it's true about the land of Israel. So to complete, you might have, I want to make it uh, relevant make a comment about modern-day politics. Have you heard of the Palestinians? I'm joking. The, there were no Palestinians back then. Until the seventh... Um, yeah, seven, 700 years. Seven, yeah, seven generation. We have Amoraim and Bavel. That's it, then they also... And then they concluded. What did they do when it concluded? Well, when it concluded, we have a completion here of the Talmud of... Some people call it the Jerusalem Talmud. It's otherwise known as the Palestinian Talmud. Palestinia is a l used hundreds of years later by, by uh, the Byzantine Empire to, to call this area. But the Talmud of the land of Israel. This is the Talmud that was concluded first, as I said, at around the year 500. But then the Talmud from here, from Bavel, is called the Talmud... Right. What did I show you here? More commonly studied is the Babylonian Talmud. Babylonian Talmud, which not only did it get 200 more years of scholarship, and it even got edited and it got spread, it gained prominence over and above the Talmud of the land of Israel. Now, the discussions are quoted one and each other. Many times in the Babylonian Talmud you have quotes from the land of Israel, from the Amoraim here. And in the ba Jerusalem Talmud you have quotes from the Babylonian scholars. There was some movement they didn't have, like today, high-speed trains or, or uh, planes. But there were people that went back and forth, and they brought teachings and the discussions. 
occurred across the borders. And so there were, there are, but essentially the recording of all of the words of the sages in the Talmud Bavli became the primary uh, Talmud that we study. And that's why it's here on my table, because the very next class after we finish ours, I teach Talmud Bavli, I teach a class in, in Gemara. It is a little bit easier because of those extra 200 years, and there was the, uh, now this is really here, um, I'll put it on the board, I'll put it on the wall actually. There is a little bit of between the two, communication? There is. I'm going to add one more thing here, just to, I know it's, there was, there was a group here at the beginning of the period, and they were called, put it in brackets, Savoraim. Mm -hmm. what they did is that they edited the Talmud Babylon. Mm -hmm. The Babylonian Talmud got an addition of, of, of uh, editors which went over the text. Sometimes they added things, sometimes they, uh, they clarified the structure of the sentences and parsing, and so it's much easier to read. It's much easier to read the Talmud Bavli. And the text is much more uh, finalized and uh, better edited, whereas the text of the Yerushalmi sometimes, you know, we still have problems with the actual finding the correct version, well, manuscripts they're missing, and so they're missing certain book, uh, Didn't uh, get the, the polishing, books. like a diamond that's polished versus yeah. a, a rough diamond. So the Talmud of Yerushalmi is like a rough diamond, and the Talmud of is more polished, and that's why it really has prominence until today. We study them both. They're both the words of our holy Amoraim and the holy Tanaim. The words of Chazal, our sages of blessed memory. They're all very precious. But it's, it is a little bit easier to study the Talmud Babli versus the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. Have, Other questions? I have yeah. a question about the Amoraim. Amoraim were, um, were they outside the land of Israel? Both. We said some were in Israel okay. and some were in Babel. There was Amorim also okay, in Israel okay. and also in Babel. Okay? Makes sense. Okay. A lot of words, a lot of terms. We're gonna we're gonna go over this. We're gonna study as we see the we'll give some some meat just like we did with the beginning stories. Now you have a feeling, you know, you've heard of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua yeah. and Rabbi Gamliel. You know they are Rabbi Gamliel died. We know how he died. Right? You, you went over this last semester. Okay. You didn't go over. The, you didn't go into it as, as deep. So it's like I'm not learning about this the first time, but because I'm learning about it the second time, it, it's all really falling into falling into I place. Hope, I hope it's falling into place. And okay. we, did, we never did this on the board before. No. no. So uh, hopefully it, it'll help. This color scheme also helps you keep the different eras uh, clear in your head. And we're going to discuss more about the period of the sages. Eventually, we're going to put it on the wall as well um, as we continue. Okay, but we'll stop here for today. And we'll uh, discuss more. We're actually going to learn, just like we learned some words of the Tanakh. We opened up the Tanakh, right? We opened up Ezra. We opened up, uh, you know, uh, Nehemiah. So we're going to open up the Mishnah. We already did some of it. Right? We opened up the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot a little bit. We're going to do some more. Let's have the Shem in the coming days.